an independent Scotland with its own currency, its own taxes, control of its own destiny, would have something going for it, which is just impossible as a part of the UK. I'm Richard Murphy, I'm Professor of Practice in International Political Economy at City University of London, where we're sitting now. I'm a chartered accountant uh, by background, I'm an economist as well. I'm perhaps best known as a tax justice campaigner. In 2003, I was one of the founding members of the Tax Justice Network, and since 2006, I've been writing the Tax Research UK blog, which is pretty widely read, and on that I talk about how tax can be used as a mechanism to create social change. Ten years ago, it would have been very hard to imagine anyone talking about Scottish independence seriously. Sure, we had a Scottish Parliament, we obviously understood that there was an SNP, and we knew that there were people who wanted independence. But was it in the mainstream? No. Was anybody taking that option seriously? To be candid, no. Now, of course, everything is fundamentally different. What has happened? Well, the rise of the SNP, but also the change in political sentiment in the rest of the UK. The, the imposition of austerity after the global financial crisis left in place a marker in the sand which said there are choices to be made, choices between a country which is fundamentally dedicated to finance and banking as the basis for its economy and one which bases its economy on real value. Whether that be oil, whether that be people, whether that be industry, whether that be alternative energy, doesn't matter. There's a fundamental difference between an economy built on finance and an economy built on the bedrock of true production of things that people need. And that is what has created this fundamental difference in approach between a London-centric view of the United Kingdom and an independent view of Scotland as a separate nation state, in my opinion. I think that the Yes movement has happened because of the whole awareness that Scotland is facing a real choice. And that choice is about what it wants to be. And that isn't just about a national identity, although obviously that matters and I'm well aware it does, but it's much, much more important than that. It's also about how we value each other, how we organise the economy, how that impacts upon ordinary people's lives. And a rejection of a system which has fundamentally put ordinary people second to the interests of finance. Now, I think that's what drove independence. I think that is what is driving a great deal about what is happening in politics generally now, this fundamental divide. It is what led Scotland to realise that it had a choice which it could make separate from anything that London and the rest of the UK wanted to impose upon it. Now, Scotland isn't alone in that, obviously but it has the unique potential to deliver it because it is so clearly different. It is a nation state within a United Kingdom. It has got its own parliament, which was granted to it a long time before really independence was truly considered. So all the options are available to it in a way that most places haven't got. But the circumstances had to be right for that independence debate to be created. And I think the global financial crisis was what provided the essential background for Scotland to consider a future which was distinct and of its own. It's my opinion that Scotland is absolutely certainly a viable independent country. Now, places with around 5 million or so people are very clearly, very obviously, surviving very well in this world. In fact, more than half the countries in the world are the size of Scotland or smaller. So let's not presume, nobody should presume, that Scotland can't survive because it's small. It actually, in world terms, is a middle-sized state. So the question is, can Scotland actually manage an economy of its size for the benefit of the people of the country to make sure that they are, well, probably at least as well off as they are now? Now, that's a much harder question. 
And it's not just a question based upon oil, although many people would like to think that is the case. The reality is that if Scotland is to become a viable independent state, in fact, if Scotland is to become a viable part of the UK self-governing within the current parliamentary system which it has, then it needs the information to be able to make truly valid economic decisions on its own part. Now, I don't believe Scotland has that information and I'm well aware that when I said so I seem to create a bit of a debate in Scotland about the whole nature of the jurors statement. the Government Expenditure and Revenue Statement for Scotland. Now, that statement is frankly, in my opinion, well, I've actually called it in a hearing in the Scottish Parliament crap. Now, in this context, crap was a technical term. It stands for completely rubbish approximations. Now, why do I say that about the JER statement? Well, simply because I don't believe it. The, the, the simple fact is that the amount that is known about Scottish taxation is very little indeed. Now, let's put it bluntly. Inside JERS, 25 of the 26 income figures are estimates. And as Graham Roy has said, uh, the fr uh, Fraser of Allender Institute, and he was responsible for preparing it for seven years, they are prepared on the basis that Scotland is a mini part of the UK and the figures are simply an apportionment of the UK as a whole. Let's look at it like this. Suppose that England, Wales and Northern Ireland are one party to a marriage and Scotland is the other party to a marriage. It assumes they're all a part of the whole. So basically, Jer says that if Scotland is about 8-9% of the whole of the UK, then 8 or 9% of the whole of the UK's income is Scotland's. Give or take a little bit for oil, and there is a give or take on that. And 8 or 9% of the spending, near enough, is Scotland's, even though that may not be true. Now, of course, we know in a relationship that's not the way it works. One partner may have more or less income than the other, and they might have quite different spending priorities. And as a result, their actual income or surplus or their spending and deficit, you know, they might run an overdraft and the other runs you know, a current account balance, then those things will not be the same. But Jers assumes that simply Scotland is a part of a bigger whole when in practice it isn't. It's a separate nation state. So Jers suggests that decisions made for the whole of the UK would continue if Scotland was independent. That's simply not true. Scotland would not have Trident, I'm quite sure. Scotland would not have the same level of armed forces. Scotland would not have the same international relationships that the UK has got. Scotland may decide to have a quite different tax system. Scotland would keep its oil revenues. And let's be clear about it, Scotland's oil revenues uh, could look very more like the Norwegian model if it was independent compared to what they are under the UK as a whole model. Scotland may have a very different perception of debt in the case of being independent because I think it's quite reasonable to argue that Scotland may have little or no national debt in the event that it was independent because it ran a surplus for so long that it didn't accumulate the UK deficit which is being borne elsewhere but which is being charged to Scotland even though it might, ne might never have generated it. All these things would make a Scottish, a genuinely Scottish financial statement look fundamentally different from the JER statement that we've got now. I can't guarantee that the result would be that Scotland would be better off because we haven't got the data to prove that. It may be worse off. It may have challenges to face. I don't deny it. But the point is that Scotland has to have that data. It, the Scottish Parliament as it is has to have that data. The independence debate, debate needs that data. And it is London that is denying it. That is the point I've made. We haven't got information 
genuine information on Scottish tax revenues for most taxes. We don't know really how much, much VAT is collected. We don't truly know all the income tax that is now being collected in Scotland, although we're moving a little bit in that direction. We have no clue on corporation tax. We have little clue on national insurance. And these are big issues. And as I've said, the spending side could be fundamentally different from that which JERS is representing. You know, one of the people who prepared um, the JERS statement for several years and simply said, JERS assumes Scotland is a mini UK. Well, I think most people who are going to watch this video don't believe that is true. I don't believe that is true. It's a nonsense way to make decisions. And so JERS has to go. But let's then consider the broader economic debate anyway. You know, is Scotland viable? Um, this is a question that wasn't truly answered in the last referendum campaign. And I have criticised the SNP and those who were involved in that campaign for not addressing some fundamental issues at that time, which I think were absolutely critical and which must be addressed if independence is ever to be on the agenda again. The people of Scotland will get the opportunity to vote yes or no to Scottish independence and what we've outlined is an exciting vision of how to, to build a, a new country and a new prosperity, a, a country at ease with itself and in full cooperation with our international friends and colleagues. Yeah, everything was great about that campaign except it didn't answer the question of currency, it didn't after answer the question of tax and it didn't answer the question of oil. Um, and unless Scotland is willing to address those issues and talk about how it will manage its own situation then I think that independence could, well, the independence to question will not reach the point of serious debate that is required if a proper decision is to be made. If Scotland walks away from the UK, it walks away from the pound. Should Scotland have its own currency? Look, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind on that one. It has to. Any country that is claiming to be independent has to have control of its own currency. We've seen the problems that smaller countries in Europe who are in the Euro are facing. They cannot manage their own economies because they are dependent upon the decisions of the European Central Bank, which takes into consideration Germany more than anybody else. So you can't run an economy without your own currency. If you have your own currency, taxation then plays a fundamentally different role in the whole economic setup. Because if you have your own currency, you can always pay your national debt, so long as it's denominated in that currency, because you just print some more. Sorry, but that's a simple fact. It's why the UK can never go bust. It's why Scotland needs its own currency, so that if it does ever have a national debt, it's denominated in its own currency, and unlike Greece, it could therefore never go bust. Tax then plays a very special role in the economy. When you have your own currency, tax is not required to meet the payment for government expenditure, because the government can always print money to do that. It won't want to print money to do all that, for very good reason. Scotland does not want hyperinflation. So tax plays the role of reclaiming the money spend, that the government spends into the economy, and it's the fundamental balancing book in the equation. But, and this is critical, Scotland will never need to run a balanced budget. It could always run a deficit. Now that's not living beyond your means, because actually the money that the government spends into the economy is well, quite literally, the money that the economy needs to function. The only way in which, well, it won't be a pound in your pocket, but whatever the new currency is called has value, is because the government has created it. The promise to pay that is written on a banknote is really important because that is what gives the currency of the country value. And the promise to pay is settled when the government accepts that currency in payment of taxation. So Scotland's money and Scotland's taxation are linked events. Scotland will be able to charge as much tax as it wants so long as it makes enough currency to pay for it. In other words, if Scotland spends wisely to put the people of Scotland to work in well-paid employment, there'll be enough money to tax to pay the cost of creating that employment in the first place with a bit of deficit 
and that's the amount of extra money that is needed to fuel growth which Scotland will want. So Scotland could take macroeconomic control of its own environment and run very well, so long as it also invests carefully. Now, Scotland isn't going to survive on oil forever. So Scotland has to do now, somewhat belatedly, the investment which Norway did a long time ago to create the long-term future for itself, which is the bedrock for its prosperity. What is that going to be in? Look, it could be in more hydro. It could definitely be in tidal energy. It could be, as we know, even in solar energy, even in Scotland. It could be exporting to a near neighbour, <laughs> England, who doesn't have enough energy resources and needs to create them. Scotland can create the technologies. Why can Scotland create the technologies? Because Scotland has great universities which it can market into the world as a major export product. Scotland has highly innovative people. Scotland could use that to its great advantage. Yeah, actually, Scotland is also a finance sector. Let's be clear about it. Um, and I don't see why it shouldn't be. Remember, Scotland has done very well in the past out of things like insurance rather than banking as such. And those two are products which could be of major significance, especially, well, as we know, the UK is leaving the EU and that puts Scotland well back into play in this area. So for many reasons, I believe that Scotland could have a viable industrial strategy around, in particular, new technologies and new manufacturing for a new era, based upon a sound macroeconomic policy which recognizes the value of an independent currency and the way in which that is linked with a proper comprehensive tax policy that delivers the social goals of a Scottish government linked to an investment strategy which develops Scotland into the long-term place where people want to invest because there are really products and services that people want to make in Scotland that the rest of the world will want. That is a basis for a Scottish independent country. If that was done, if that was delivered, if that was explained, and the employment and growth opportunities that come out of that were laid down for people to see, then I think Scotland is a viable independent state, which looks fundamentally different from the rest of the UK, which is going to remain dominated by finance for a lot longer. And that's the difference which people could then choose between. Scotland's future should be in Scotland's hands. That is what this debate is about, the future of our country. How we best harness our potential as a country and overcome the challenges that we face. Is she going to spend the next two years and 100% of her time campaigning for Scotland to leave the UK at the expense of governing? Or will she roll up her sleeves from today and seek to secure more powers for this parliament when they return from Brussels to Britain? Let's be realistic. Scotland may have a long-term independent future, but Scotland right now is part of the UK. I believe that the Scottish Parliament needs to flex its muscles. And I'm not talking about just the SNP or the Greens, who are obviously both interested in independence. I believe that this is as important for the other parties who are in the Scottish Parliament as well. The Scottish Parliament needs genuinely independent data on what is happening in the Scottish economy to make decisions which are right for the Scottish people. You can't have a parliament that doesn't know what is happening in the economy that it is managing. And so Scotland has to say to London, we need data on our taxes. We need more control of our taxes. Not just tiny little bits, as has been given now. The stupidity, for example, of granting control over higher rates of income tax in Scotland to the Scottish Parliament, but not giving control over dividend and other investment income to the Scottish Parliament, which means that those who want to avoid Scottish high rates of tax simply form companies, pay themselves dividends and get out of the control of Scotland. I mean, when you create loopholes like that, Scotland is just incapacitated from the outset by having insufficient control over the decisions it can make at Holyrood. No, Scotland needs to demand comprehensive powers over taxation so it can really decide how to make decisions which don't have loopholes built into them by Westminster. It needs to have the data to decide how it's going to manage. It needs to demand the power, for example, to do its own quantitative easing or take a share of it. Remember, £435 billion pounds worth of quantitative easing was done in the UK as a whole to bail out banks fundamentally none of which are now based in Scotland. Suppose 8% of that money, 
35 billion had instead been used to create a Scottish investment fund. What would that have done? What could Scotland have done if it had been allowed to use quantitative easing instead of PFI? And the curse of PFI, which has been forced upon the Scottish government because it was the only way it could effectively borrow, had been eliminated. Then there wouldn't be that problem hanging over so many Scottish institutions of having to pay that debt. These are the powers that Scotland needs to claim for itself so that it can actually issue its own bonds, its own literally loans, so that it can be in control of its own capital expenditure, so that it can create an economic infrastructure for itself. For heaven's sake, there's a hundred plus MSPs in Edinburgh in Scotland who have the ability to actually manage an economy, who can be trusted to do it, but they've got to demand that right. So frankly, whilst we have weak government in Westminster, and we are going to have weak government in Westminster for some time to come, and there is a need for people to take into consideration the role of minority partners and the demands that they make, then Scotland, from, and this is, again, I repeat, from MPs of all parties, because we're seeing even the Conservatives in Scotland saying that they have a separate identity from the Conservatives in England. All parties need to stand up and say, we need the powers that are necessary for Scotland to make its own decisions, whether within the UK or one day potentially outside, but right now within. And it hasn't got that. And so let's make the Scottish Parliament, as it stands, credible by giving it the powers to decide genuinely about what taxation is required, genuinely about what expenditure is necessary, and as importantly, what investment it wants to make using a power to borrow that Scotland is plenty big enough to exercise. Brexit matters for Scotland. Of course it does. Uh, because Scotland is going to be dragged a little bit kicking, a little bit screaming outside the European Union, whether it likes it or not. I cannot see the Brexit process stopping now, whatever the people of Scotland think. But actually, Scotland then has to turn this into an opportunity. Because an independent Scotland which becomes independent outside the European Union, has, of course, the opportunity to create its own currency. And let's be clear about it. If Scotland was to then reapply to join the EU, European Union, and I would be inclined to think that would be a wise thing to do, um, it will go in with a currency. And the EU says that a country that joins must commit to becoming part of the euro. It doesn't actually say it has to become part of the euro. It says it must commit to being part of the euro. I don't know how many years it is now that Sweden has offered the commitment but not actually joined, but it's a lot. And I genuinely think that Scotland could have an independent currency for a long time. Now, I believe that across Europe, we may, might see other countries now considering whether they want to leave the euro or whether the euro will in fact voluntarily be broken into regions or whatever in the future. But Scotland could consider rejoining with its own currency, with its own tax system, with its own ability to therefore raise its own money in its own currency, which means it could, could never go bust. I cannot make that point strongly enough. A country with its own currency can never go bust because it can always pay, because it can always print some more when well, it doesn't actually print it. To be honest, it enters some entries on a computer keyboard, as simply as that one over there, um, to make the money to pay the debt. But in that case, Scotland could remain viable in the long term whilst being a member of the EU. Embrace the European ideal, but embrace it as an independent Scotland with an independent currency. And Scotland could, well, I'm not going to say it could have its cake and eat it, because that would be absurd, but it could have some of the best bits of all economic opportunity with, in fact, some of the, or fewer of the downsides than it's got now, because it wouldn't be treated as some subordinate entity within an organization that doesn't really want to recognize its independent existence, its own validity, and provide it with the data to make proper economic decisions about its own future. I think Scotland has to regret leaving the EU. It has to plan to return to the EU but actually on its own terms, as an independent country with its own currency. Scotland did not talk sufficiently about taxation 
in 2014. I wrote a book which was published in 2015 called The Joy of Tax, and I'm going to do a shameless plug for it because I only talk about tax as part of the total macroeconomic system of a country. All government spending is paid for out of newly created money if a country has its own central banking currency. Tax cancels the money that is created to make sure inflation doesn't follow. But in that case, tax does not pay for government spending. Tax is an instrument of control within the economy. But that also lets it be something else as well. And that is an instrument of social policy. So tax is about redistribution of income and wealth. Tax is about repricing for market failure because markets don't do things properly. Tax is about managing fiscal deficits, reorganizing the economy. Tax is about giving value to the money because if you have to pay your tax in the local currency, you've got to use it and that guarantees that it will be the Scottish currency and not pounds or dollars or euros that would be used in Scotland. And tax becomes a fundamental part of the relationship between the electorate and the government because it's the bit in the middle you know, we talk about a social contract between a government and the people of a country. Well, contracts have what is called consideration in them. Consideration is payment, and tax is that payment. It's what makes people get angry with governments, go out and vote, make change, hold people to account. And let's be honest, an independent Scotland has got to have a vibrant democracy involving a multi-party system. So different ideas about how to set priorities in Scotland as reflected in the way in which Scotland will tax for the benefit of who will be fundamental to its future. So the Scottish tax system has to be central to any debate about an independent Scotland. And let's not pretend that that tax system has to be the one inherited from the UK. Oh, look, there'll be features of that system that we'll, we will recognise. There'll be an income tax. There'll be a corporation tax. There will be a VAT. Does there need to be a national insurance which discourages employment? Why? Could we do something better? I suggest we probably could in an independent Scotland. Do we have to have no taxation on wealth, which has been one of the features of the UK wide system where inheritance tax is almost irrelevant and frankly got round by all those with real wealth because it's claimed that whatever they own is farming or business property and therefore no tax is payable. No, we, don't, we need a proper wealth tax in Scotland, undoubtedly. You know, capital gains should not be a loophole for the wealthy to basically avoid lots of tax. It should be enforced. So Scotland would end up with a very different tax system. But that's a strength. But on the other hand, before anyone talks about independence in Scotland again, someone has got to think about how that system works. And someone's got to work out how the transition from where we are now, with Scotland having very few taxation powers, to a much better transitional system where the Scottish Parliament can really run Scottish taxation very much independently of the rest of the UK, to a fully independent system, all of that has got to be worked out. And frankly, that hasn't been done yet. And that is a real challenge. When that problem is solved, then most of the building blocks for an independent Scottish state are in place. I've been asked the question often, what would I do if I lived in Scotland? Look, it's obvious from my accent and from my name that I'm not Scottish. Um, but suppose I decided to move north of the border. How would I vote in an independence referendum? I have no doubt I would vote yes. Um, that's not a wholly rational choice. I don't pretend it is. Uh, I don't think, despite the fact that I understand economics, that most of human life is about being rational. Human life is about being emotional. Human life is about making decisions based upon, to a very large extent, what your heart thinks because we cannot process enough information in our brains to actually make rational decisions. And my heart would tell me Scotland should be independent. And my heart would tell me, and my economic intuitions would support the fact that if Scotland became independent, it could be better off. And the reason why is that when head and heart are combined, and I've given lots of reasons why, 
you know, the head has to get a lot of things right before Scottish independence can happen on the economy, on tax and everything else. But if that head bit can be got right, then the heart bit can be released to actually release Scotland to achieve its full potential. The goal of any economy, any country, is to achieve its full potential. And right now, Scotland is being treated as it has been, well, for 300 years probably, as a second-rate bit of the United Kingdom. It isn't. If Scotland had a genuine feeling that it was control, a genuine feeling that it was creating Scottish products, not just for Scottish people, but for the world at large, then I believe it would release a new wave of entrepreneurialism, a new spirit, which would be seen both within government and the private sector, working together, they have to, in Scotland to create a totally new Scottish identity. You can't measure that. You can't put a value on that. But what you can do is say it transformed things. And we've seen it. Look, we're recording this just after we've seen the most extraordinary election result in the UK as a whole. The Conservatives won, and they're crushed, and they look defeated. Labour lost, and it looks as though it's had a victory. Perceptions, understandings, movement, direction, confidence make all the difference. And an independent Scotland with its own currency, its own taxes, control of its own destiny, would have something going for it, which is just impossible as a part of the UK. And I go to a lot of countries as a result of my work, around Europe and outside, many of which are the size of Scotland and smaller. Damn it, I hold a passport from Ireland, which is smaller than Scotland. And they are proud and independent and in control of their destinies in the way in which Scotland is not at present and which it should be. That's why I vote yes, because I believe it will release the potential of the people in Scotland to achieve what isn't possible at present. And that, to me, is a goal worth achieving. Thank you.